when we look to electric electrification of transportation, our foundation should be public transportation because then it is inclusive. It's everywhere and it's available to all. And that's probably one of the most important issues. We need to start thinking circularly and systemically like that to say, this is an inclusive conversation. We need to make charging and electrification available across industry boundaries. Great to have with us some of the Canadian tech uh, innovators on the show today. Um, Margaret Cullen, you are the Trade Commissioner at the Canadian Consulate. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today and for bringing me this idea. When we were down in Miami at the um, CoMotion Conference, you said to me, Paul, I got a great idea. Tell us what your idea was. First of all, thank you so much, Paul. And uh, your reputation precedes you. So I was dying to get to meet you. And again, as I've mentioned in other conversations, just uh, seeing all the great work that you've done. And the idea came to me that I was working with these amazing Canadian companies that are solving some of the greatest issues out there. And I, you know, this just popped into my head. Why not get them on with you and talk about how they're solving these issues. And not only that, they're they're thought leaders, they're seeing what's coming down the road and what they're doing to, to solve these problems. Yeah, I love that idea. And I'm so happy you brought it to me. Transit Unplugged, as you know, it's heard around the world, and but we are sponsored by a Canadian company. So it made sense, right? So, you know, Trapeze and Vontis and our parent company, uh, Volaris, which goes up to Constellation Software, which is traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange, one of the world's largest uh, software companies and most successful ones is our parent company. And so, you know, through Medaxo, which uh, encaptures all like over 30 uh, vertical software companies, we also are focused on this industry. And so I thought it'd be great to have on a transit agency and some transit uh, agency partners, the vendors that help them reach their goals. And so uh, we've got with us on the air today, Nicholas Vesalius, who is Senior Manager of Innovation Management and New Mobility at TransLink in Vancouver, Canada. Nicholas, thank you so much for being with us on the air today. Yeah, happy to. Thanks for inviting me. I'm a loyal listener, Paul, and thanks for all you're doing to, to bring the, the latest trends out in the world. So thank you. Awesome. And I'm also super excited to have Colin Lavery, who is Chief Growth Officer at the company Asset Market. Colin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Paul, for the invitation. It's, it's wonderful to be here. So uh, great to have you both. And it, it, what we're going to talk about today really ties together. So with Nicholas, we're going to talk to you about some of the great um, kind of like innovations, macro trends happening in transit and, the, and what TransLink is doing. And with Colin, we're going to talk about a really interesting angle on what's happening uh, across North America and the world today, which is everyone is moving their vehicle fleets, whether they're government fleets or private companies or even public transit fleets to uh, electric fleets or to um, battery electric in many cases. Other people are looking at other fuels, but battery electric clearly is leading the way. And with these EVs, these electric vehicles coming onto the market, it's so important for governments especially to make sure that they have analyzed where to put all these charging stations. Government agencies now are involved in placing charging stations around, and um, it is important for them to put them in the right places. Well, Colin is going to talk to us about how to do that analysis and how to use artificial intelligence to do that analysis, and also to make sure that every community is covered, so that we have equity and inclusion in the placement of these chargers. So I can't wait to get to that discussion as well, Colin. Thank you for joining us and helping to lead that discussion. But first, let's kick it off with Nicholas. Nicholas, I was just up visiting you all mm -hmm. uh, in the last couple of months. We were uh, the Transit Unplugged team, came to Vancouver. Uh, we filmed an episode of Transit Unplugged TV there, which has aired in the month of May and is um, one of our best performing episodes ever on YouTube, where we talked to Kevin Quinn, your chief executive officer, a good friend of mine that worked with me in Baltimore as uh, oh. as the head of uh, our planning office and was also became the CEO after I left and now is leading one of the most, um, you know, one of the leading transit systems clearly in North America, if not the world. So we talked about some of those uh, kind of the big service options. And today we're going to talk to you about some of the innovations you all are doing. So welcome to the show and kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your office and some of the pilots that you're working on there in Vancouver, Canada. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I know Canadians don't like to toot their horn so much, but I'm only half Canadian, so I can just echo what you said. I'm very proud to be, yeah, I would say one of the leading for sure uh, transit agencies in terms of you know pandemic recovery now, latest, but even before that, you know, a number of after trophies and, and, and a lot of loyal customers and and i would like to say 
a lot of uh, local population support. I mean, we need political support. It's not necessarily profitable to, to run a transit agency uh, and, and to, to provide the transit to people. And I would like to say that BC, British Columbia here, have really stood up during the pandemic and before and, and seeing that transit transportation is such an important part of, of our region. So the, the funding keeps coming and we're doing our best to, to provide kind of a cost-effective build-out because we are a growing region. We grow a lot. And I think that stands out a bit from other cities too in North America where we have such an influx of, of immigration, right? I mean, so we, we could barely keep up before pandemic and now we're kind of back to, you know, kind of catching up and, and building as fast as we can. So my, my office quickly is basically it's the innovation office in our agency. So we, we label it new mobility. Uh, which is a broad thing, but our mandate is basically to to uh, refine new ideas coming in and make them happen. And and chal- I would say challenge our agency a bit too, both, both policy wise, strategy wise, and then kind of t- tech wise on on trying out new things. So we're running a number of pilots, and we're trying to influence policy into kind of future proofing translink. That's great. There are so many big things happening um, at your agency. Um, and I know that's why, Margaret, that's why you chose them to be on this show, right? You wanted to you wanted to highlight some of what they're doing? Absolutely. So, Nicholas, give us a few of the of the big trends that are happening. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting time to be in public transit, in transportation, I would say. We talk about four big forces, and, and there are more, I'm sure, but we need to really educate ourselves and more than educate, I think we need to influence these forces to not become, you know, negative for, for a city. And we talk about automation, of course, like the, the fundamental changes we will see in travel demand and kind of transportation business models in the next years, including for public transit. We talk about connectivity where, you know, all our vehicles, infrastructure is going to go online, is, is going online. So the real time uh, nature of, of uh, connectivity is going to make fundamental changes happen, how we deliver our services electrification and we have Colin here I mean uh, that's that's perhaps the first big big visible you know push towards because of our climate emergency we have to act fast but it's going to be a massive change in how we operate as well and, and our fleet and, and we're doing what we can to to for the next decade now to upgrade everything and then perhaps the most uh, powerful I will say but easy to forget is the the customers change of perception and and the new business models that comes with that so I mean car sharing and bike sharing and and shared micro mobility is one example of people are thinking a bit differently in, on how they stitch their you know travel patterns together and I think that kind of public perception that that customer uh, change those changes are very important and they come with really interesting new business models that le- legitimately kind of kind of can compete with with the personal uh, vehicle so a lot of things happening that's great one of the things we we uh, are hearing a lot about right now uh, in the spring and early summer of 2023 is artificial intelligence uh, with the advent of chat GPT, it just seems like it's really just coming into the public consciousness, the zeitgeist moment of AI. And every day I see articles about how AI is going to you know, solve so many problems for us. Uh, but I also see articles about how it could lead to the destruction of humankind. Uh, mm-hmm. So tell us about how you're thinking of using artificial intelligence there at TransLink. Yeah, first kudos to uh, to you know Canadian government. I guess I don't know if it's well known, but Canada has you know AI has been have a lot of up and downs. I, I'm I'm an old you know academic myself, uh, and I, I follow not AI necessarily, but a lot of research trends. They've been you know from the 60s, 70s, you know, have been hyped and and going up and down. And Canada has throughout these years been funding research in AI. So I th- I would say Canada number one is. Uh, one of the leading nations and uh, doing a lot of really cool research here. We should tap into that. Now, AI uh, hit us pretty hard, right? We, we from from like uh, not thinking about it, being very, you know, kind of, again, academic and, and um, abstract. We see real world applications now, uh, good and bad. I think we have to be careful, but optimistic. <laughs> we are already trying out a few things. You asked about some pilots we're running. We are using AI to to make kind of dumb traffic cameras. And we have a bunch of them in the city, much smarter, and start to collect data on congestion and, and vehicle types and all that. that that's one one way to kind of leverage AI, you can use kind of dumb uh, physical infrastructure, but with a smart AI brain and help us with that. We're using AI for bus predictions 
And there's there's much more to come, preventive maintenance and all that. Now, AI, in a sense, is, is not smart than the humans who are coding it. So we have to be careful to make sure that equity concerns and, and a lot of other, other things we as humans would take for granted is, is kind of coded into the AI. But in general, I see a lot of opportunities and, and we have to uh, you know start trying them out. Colin, uh, let's mix this up a little bit and bring you into the conversation. With artificial intelligence, my understanding is you guys are using artificial intelligence to help people analyze where the best place is to put these EV chargers. Is that right? Well, what we're doing is we're we're understanding the data that we have access to and that uh, different organizations are collecting and storing. And what we're doing is we're trying to uncover that data and trying to overlay it uh, to be able to demonstrate demand, to be able to demonstrate use, and then to be able to predict where the demand is going in the future so that we understand exactly what we need today and we can evaluate whether we're hitting the mark. And then we can look to tomorrow. We can look to a year down the road. We can look to five years down the road and potentially 10 years down the road. And we can understand where we need to be so that we can start to make those plans and to take those actions today. Margaret, I know uh, without maybe naming the governments you've talked to, but um, tell us what you're hearing from local governments that they are right now starting this process of, or maybe they've already started it, but they're in the process of trying to figure out where to put all these, right? They're getting, there's federal money coming in. Talk to us a little bit about what you've heard so far. Sure. So yes, a lot of federal money come in, coming in as we know. So I think the problem is, is where, again, going back to where do you put these uh, charging stations? And if they're put in the wrong place, it can cause fires and cause all kinds of havoc. I know that the transport, the transport agencies are, you know, they're putting out our RFPs on this, looking at companies who can help them solve these issues. And I think going back to what TransLink said, it's having the right partners. Uh, it's not just going to be, it's no, there's no one silver bullet. It's going to be different companies, entities working together uh, to make this, you know, easier because otherwise we're going to have a bit of chaos down the road. But I think in order for this to work out, we do need to work together and AI is going to be pivotal in, um, in making this happen. Yeah, where you and I met was at Commotion uh, Miami, and uh, there was a lot of talk at that conference. I consider that one of the most forward-leaning conferences when it comes into tech uh, that I that I go to on a regular basis. And there were a lot of companies, a lot of vendors there talking about their role in the ecosphere that's coming of this big push and billions and billions of dollars being put into the market. Nicholas, you you all at TransLink, I know when I talked to Kevin Quinn, a big hunk of your fleet is already electrified. <laughs> But you're also moving that way when it comes to your buses, right? Yeah, we call them trolley buses. Yeah, we have a big trolley bus. Uh, I mean, as as many cities had a long time ago, right? It's an old technology. Now, uh, we we are geographically a very spread out region. Uh, I don't know, those who haven't visited, and please come visit Vancouver. I mean, we call it Metro Vancouver. We have 23 municipalities or mayors competing. uh, being together here in a large geographic space with bridges full, but you know we have these choke points and, and large geography which are deserved. So we know that some 35%, I think, of all uh, greenhouse gases here come from transportation. It's the largest source of, of GHGs, like greenhouse gases in the region. So we have committed, I would say, quite aggressively to, to really electrifying our bus, bus fleet. And we are, we are aiming to become net zero GHG uh, by 2050. That means that we're going to have to get going quickly with, with the help of innovation you know, in the industry, our, our OEMs, Nova and New Flyer others. We are as quick as we can, I would say, and can finance it, electrifying our buses. We have chosen... Uh, in depot charging. It's easy to say that you equip and buy these buses, but you have to have the infrastructure behind it. And, uh, and, and we have to build out these charging stations and plan the system. And I think, again, AI might, might be instrumental in trying to uh, really balance and see where these chargers should be, even for us, how often should the buses charge and, and all that. Because it's kind of a bit of a tension between providing the best possible service and, and having the buses charge. So it's going to be a whole layer of new kind of bus management uh, included that. And I think the hundreds of buses now we are committed to buy, it's going to make change our operation. Remember to our, you know, going from combustion engine to electric, it, it takes some labor um, 
uh, upskilling and, and reskilling. We are not sure, like I would say if, and I'm, I'm not an expert, but if we would switch everything on, on electric now, in, including privately owned vehicles, our grid here in BC will not be able to handle it. So we're working closely with BC Hydro and all our utility companies to make sure that the infrastructure is ready. And then, of, of course, we have the, the big thing. We are lucky to have a lot of green uh, energy. But, I mean, going electric uh, in transportation um, only makes it better, the world better, if we have clean primary energy, right? So we cannot start, you know, burning up coal or oil or whatever to make the electricity and then run our buses. We have to have a whole kind of value chain uh, or supply chain thinking of securing the electricity in a clean way. So very complex, but ve- but I think it's a big, big move um, towards this. And and then we have our role, and I will finish with that, as an influencer, where I think interesting to talk to Colin too, where, yes, we can electrify all our buses and, and, and whatnot, but the big, of course, game changer is um, the private loan vehicles. And if we can make it easier and help to build the ecosystem and infrastructure, to support the whole kind of holistic electrification of all transportation, that would be uh, really good, right? So we're working on that as well. That's great. Yeah, let's bring you into the conversation, Colin. So talk to us about uh, not only the importance of, you know, analyzing where these stations need to go, charging stations, but also ensuring that we, uh, you know, do this with the lens of equity and inclusion to make sure that all communities are are covered by this uh, charging technology. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, to lead off, I would say that Margaret and Nicholas hit on uh, two of the key foundational uh, items in, in the way that we need to think about the proliferation of this and, and the equity and inclusion, and that is uh, partnerships and circular thinking. So we need to understand right down at the grassroots level, what is required from, from which partner uh, and how do we go about bringing the, the the majority into that conversation? So uh, Nicholas touched on who we you know who we look to as our uh, our utility providers, and are they part of this engaged conversation? And and the ubiquity of the nature of where it needs to be, and that is everywhere. Because obviously, when we look to electric electrification of transportation, our our foundation should be public transportation because then it is inclusive. It's everywhere, and it's available to all. Uh, And that's probably one of the the most important the most important issues. And then to Margaret's point, it's it's no one organization is going to do this on on its own. It has to be a confluence of uh, of organizations and people and and efforts uh, to make it happen. So Great, Colin. looking at uh, at all of the different types of partners, whether they be software AI partners, whether they be utility partners, uh, and and local communities, local governments, uh, or the aggregation thereof, as Nicholas mentioned in the Metro Vancouver area, um, you know, we need to start thinking circularly and systemically like that to say this is an inclusive conversation. Uh, we need to make charging and electrification available to to you know uh, across uh across industry uh boundaries so looking to public transportation industries and then looking to availability for your individual user who will not have a choice soon enough you know the 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 effort that will be undertaken about trading your car in or or acquiring a new car um the choice is going to be electric and so it's a matter of how do we prepare ourselves for that tsunami and the way that we're going to be moving, uh, both as it, you know, and it, as an individual, but then also as part of a, a local community? That's great, Colin. Nicholas, talk to us about that partnership that Colin just raised, which is how that public transit agencies and local governments may not have all the solutions among their own quote employees, but the partners that they utilize and the and the way transit agencies can best utilize those partners in the private sector. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's an important point. There's an element, I would say, of like not invented here and all that in all, all large organizations, right? We have so many smart people, so a lot of ideas brewing. And, and we have to take that, I would say, first, internal innovation seriously as well to empower staff to really get those ideas up to the top and we get them funded. But yes, no matter how many people we have, smart people within, the innovation and the big shifts are happening in industry, in part in academia. So I think it's important to open up at least a few windows for a transit agency, kind of get out there, show show that you don't have all the answers. We have a bit of a, almost, I would say, a responsibility as, as the public, you know, you know, quasi-monopolist, at least on public transit here in, 
in when you take that kind of role, have that kind of mandate, broad mandate, you have to set aside time and effort and money to reach out to uh, external innovators, see what they have. We have a few channels, uh, clear kind of cut out channels like our opening re- call for innovation and and our kind of academic research funding program where we actively go out and say, hey, we don't have all the answers. We are interested in your help. We want to work together with you. And here is kind of the way to do it. So so I think to be out there also in conferences and, and talk about this thing, then I think in the end, it's about trust, right? Um, especially many small innovators, I, I can see small companies have good ideas. They see transit agencies uh, as the government with the big G, hard to work with, bureaucratic, and they won't take me serious and all this. I, I like to say like we need to be uh, create lower barriers of entry for also smaller SMEs, kind of smaller companies, individual innovators and all to reach out to us. It can be as easy as having a clear point of contact to give them feedback, to involve them, be out and hackathons and, and show ourselves and you know visit commotion and, and talk about these things. But I think in the end, it's about trust building and saying that, yes, we have the interest and we have the mechanism and the funding ready to try out things that are not fully baked. We don't necessarily only have to work with the Microsofts and the IBMs, nothing wrong with them, but we also have a lot of lo- really good local companies, I guess around the world, smaller companies that we are working kind of would like to co-create ideas with and maybe share the uh, IPR later. But th- I think those those things have to happen and we are slowly getting there. Yeah. Colin, I really like the word you used, the tsunami of uh, of electric vehicles that is going to come soon. And uh, Nicholas, I'm going to ask you to comment on this too as our last question, which is how do we future-proof and get ourselves ready? I mean, we've talked about getting ready right now. So, Colin, you've talked about the importance of figuring out where do these charging stations need to go now. You've talked about uh, making sure that the value chain all the way up or the supply chain is clean as well. But let's look to the future. What are your thoughts on kind of future proofing for private companies, for government agencies when it comes to this area of um, clean fuel, clean technology? Yeah, I think that that's that's a really important question, Paul. And I think that what it it stems from is, is knowing what the demand is today. Uh, and where where your where your users uh, live, commute to, uh, where they go for their recreation, and and understand what those distances look like and what the grid looks like today. Where where are those uh, opportunities to uh, to charge today, and where will they need to be? Given the fact that people will not have, you know, there there won't be a lot of alternatives. It will be, we are moving to clean energy. We're moving to electrification because it just makes good sense. It makes good environmental sense. And where do we need to have those, that that infrastructure located in order to be able to meet that demand? So to be able to, you know, open up to the fact that this is coming and, and now is the time that we can do all of this amazing research that we can, that we can, partner together, just as Nicholas and as Margaret have mentioned, uh, and we can start that dialogue and we can really start to lay a good, strong foundation for where we will need to be in, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, so that we're prepared for it. And, And I think it was Margaret who opened up the conversation earlier today about, you know, a lot of public funding being placed into this realm because because it does make good environmental sense. It, it does make sense for our planet. And it's looking at how do we best use those research dollars and those funding dollars for infrastructure today? And then how do we set the, the course for the future? Um, and it's understanding where supply is located today and where demand is moving tomorrow. And how do we ensure that A, all of those, those partners along the value chain are prepared? So are the utilities prepared? Are the EV charging companies prepared? Are all of the users prepared? And uh, and Margaret is right. There, there's a lot of funding available. Uh, and, and how do we use it wisely today so that we're not five years from now saying, oh, oops, yeah, it didn't really make sense to put those 15 chargers along that stretch of the freeway <laughs> in yeah. the XYZ location. And, you know, one of the things that Margaret said as well earlier in the conversation was really poignant. And that is, you know, we want to be able to understand where to place the infrastructure to avoid uh, accidents or catastrophes. And that's very important. But additionally, and coupled along with that, it's we want to make them, we want to make them available in spots that make 
uh, user and economic sense as well. So where are we going to get the best return on investment for all of this infrastructure? Because it is very expensive. It is very dear. And we want to treat it that way right from day one. We want to say we want to make the most intelligent siting decisions we can based on where the usership is today and where it's moving to uh, in 5, 10, 15 years, as I mentioned. And that bodes true for individual users, just like the four of us. But it also bodes true for large scale, uh, large scale organizations like public transportation, like school bus fleets, like long haul trucking fleets. All of those industries are looking to electrification as well, because as I mentioned, it just makes good sense. Uh, and all of the backwards work and thinking that has to go into, all right, so if we want to electrify this fleet of school buses, we need to understand what the routes are. No different from, you know, the way that Nicholas's organization is probably looking at uh, the buses in the in right. Vancouver area. So how many average riders do we have per route? And does, does that make a difference? What is our climate? And so where are these charging hubs that we need to have based on ridership and perhaps weight that, that's in the vehicle on the climate or, or what kind of HVAC you're going to be running in these vehicles and how will that have an effect on the, the, the frequency and the length that we will have to make these vehicles stop and charge back. So it's all of those things, all of those, you know, that confluence of events uh, where we need that, that partnership mentality to say, yeah, we're not going to do this alone. So as Nicholas put it, how do we lower the barriers to entry for, for all sorts of use cases? And how do we get enough you know, intelligent thinking around this and planning around this today so that the future continues to look very bright and to continues to look very clean? That was great, Colin. Great comprehensive look at all these issues. Nicholas, uh, in our final brief few moments, tell us about how TransLink is future-proofing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in, in this specific area, all all uh, all Col what Colin said is uh, is awesome. I say, I mean, from ours, I keep coming back to our buyer buying power and our investments. I mean, I, we really should lead by examples, which we are, and and do our own homework and upgrading our you know our our bus fleet and and marine marine fleet as well. We have ferries and and all our facilities. But so leading by example. But then we also have this kind of carrot and stick. We should become more educated when we partner up, right? When we partner up with someone else, we should put the same pressure as we put ourselves on our partners, on our on our vendors and, and, and others, right? So we should have a really educated way of procuring things and always demand like a roadmap towards electrification and how, what, pushing everyone along. And then we have the role as an influencer, I would say. I mean, we we cannot force our, all our privately owned cars to electrify as quick as you want, but but we could help by helping to, in a, you know, in, in partnerships with our utility, utilities and others, promote uh, more EV charging infrastructure. We can help out, especially what we're doing now on shared micromobility, uh, putting putting aside perhaps uh, more space and in our facilities in order to support sustainable kind of green electric modes, such as sh shared micromobility. So, sometimes, you know, a chip that is not taken is is uh, is the greenest, right? So also to start keep using the holistic view of of land use in combination with transportation and build the city in a so smart way, so so that we can be you know uh, give access to everyone. But uh, and then again, I think every in all this we are we are one player. We are one of the major you know in infrastructure owners and operators, but there are others there. So to work together with. Other major entities at the airport, we have the YBR, our airport, we have a bunch of the port and so on, and really try to drive innovation together. That's going to be important. It's great. Thanks, Nicholas. And Margaret, thank you for um, bringing, bringing this idea forward of, um, you know, C Canada has some of the most forward leaning, not, not only do you have great actors and great musicians that come out of there, so many of them that we here in America and around the world uh, enjoy and are entertained by and your sports teams and all, but you've got great tech leaders as well. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for bringing this forward. And I think going back to the beginning, uh, what Nicholas said was how Canada had thought about this early on, especially about uh, AI. I think that that's, um, that was really forward thinking, making Canada 
one of the leading countries in the world, if not number one. But Well, we're happy to showcase what you're doing on this episode and maybe even a future episode uh, coming up later this summer. Thank you, Colin, Nicholas, and Margaret for making this a very informative session of Transit Unplugged. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Transit Unplugged with our special guests, Margaret Cohen, Nicholas Vesalius, and Colin Lavery. And coming up next week on Transit Unplugged, we're continuing our series on Canadian transit tech innovation with Margaret Cohen, Tim Bigwood, Jean-Pierre Barakat, and Brad Cameron. It's a little snippet from that interview. But the element which is somewhat underestimated right now and is starting to be on very much on people's minds is the operational cybersecurity. It's making sure that that equipment cannot be hacked and that that equipment is safe in every way. Luckily, we've never had a big incident or a big accident uh, yet, but we are at risk of having equipment hacked. If you have a question, comment, or would like to be a guest on Transit Unplugged, feel free to email us anytime at info at transitunplugged.com. Transit Unplugged is brought to you by Medaxo. At Medaxo, we're passionate about moving the world's people. And at Transit Unplugged, we're passionate about telling those stories. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.